there, there was a man that gave an incredibly powerful evangelistic message. Okay. And um, the sermon was so powerful that over 200 people came and gave their lives to Christ. And like it's, it was, there were so many people, it was just hard to keep up with them all. But anyway, uh, there were, there were finally thoroughly exhausted. Okay. That after this ordeal and, and meeting with everybody that the, the preacher's finally making his way to his car at the end of the evening. And this young man came up to him saying, sir, I, I have a question for you. And the pastor was so tired. And so worn out that he said to the young man, I am so weary right now. Could you please come back in the morning? Well, he never saw that young man again. But I, I shared that to tell you this, that um, wasn't uh, was just a couple weeks back. Um, I was in, in the parking lot of Home Depot and I was loading my truck. And we with some materials for the job that we're working on. And there was a lot of stuff. There was like uh, boxes, cases of flooring and, and uh, uh, lighting and stain and uh, uh, sealer and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, the last thing that they brought out was this cart of like all the stain and degreaser and stuff like that. And I, I didn't want to just put the unopened boxes on the truck. Because then if we got to the job site and I was short, like we went all the way to Campwood and wouldn't be able to do the job. So I'm going through all these boxes. And then that was when it was like 113 degrees. Like it was like so super hot and like the sweat is pouring off of me and I'm going through the boxes and they're all mixed up and I've got this list. I'm trying to check them off and things aren't adding up and I'm coming up short. And um, so I just wanted to be careful because uh, when the guys got out there, if we didn't have the stuff to do the job, it, it would have blew up the whole day. So anyway, uh, this guy came up and he was like so eager to help me. I just like, can I can help you. Can I help you? And, and like, I'm on the last box and like, I don't even know what's in it. And it's, I'm coming up short and he's like smoking a cigarette and the smoke's going in my face and he's trying to, trying to help me and uh and so like finally i i kind of get in my mind that i am short but i just have to go in and talk to him about it and so i nod my head he takes the box he puts it on the truck and and he starts to walk away and then i heard just like this little voice you know like saying you know to to like share with him and and but man i was so hot i was so tired i did share with him and like the tracks were in the truck and like there's five million excuses but you know, not, not one that, that was good enough. And so um, even though, like, Patty and I had prayed that morning, Lord, put someone on my path that needs to hear about you. And there were so many encounters that day that I shared with people. And I thought, surely this is the one. Okay, this is the one the Lord sent. And I shared with them. And, and, uh, and so, but. I didn't share with them, man. And uh, so my prayer today is uh, that, Lord, if you give me another opportunity, you know, to run into him, because, uh, you know, maybe that was the one man that needed to hear that message, okay, that, that I didn't give. Maybe that was the one. Maybe the other ones didn't even need it. Maybe they maybe I accepted it. Maybe I just thought they needed it. But, Maybe it was that one that needed to hear that message so his soul would be saved. But if I would have just died to myself and been a faithful servant, then uh, that man would have heard what he needed to hear that day. So anyway, um, that said, uh, <clears throat> kind of sparked this sermon. So <clears throat> if uh, you want to turn with me in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 20. That's the text I'll be taking this morning. And we'll be reading John 20 through 27. 
when you found your way there, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word to show respect. And I titled this, uh, I titled this message, uh, just let go, let go. Okay, starting in verse 20, John chapter 12. Now there were certain great Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. If you bow your heads, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are but dust. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Forgive us where we have failed you. Forgive us where we have failed each other. These are your words, Father, in the words of your son, Jesus. And they're not ours, but they have much meaning. If you had not sent your son to die on the cross for us, if he had not come, then we could have no part in you. It's only because of what he did and what he accomplished that we are, it's even possible for us to be here today in this place and allowed to come into your presence, Lord. I ask that you would speak to us today through your word and through your Holy Spirit, that if it be your will, that there will be a move of God this morning so powerful that it could not help but draw souls unto you. Father, use your servant right now and continue to use all these here for your glory. Your will be done this hour and in the hours to come. And it's in the name of your holy and righteous son, Jesus. And for his sake, Heavenly Father, that we ask and pray. Amen. And y'all may be seated. <clears throat> In verses 20 through 22, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more to it than that, but uh, the Greeks came to Philip and asked Jesus, asking to see Jesus, and, and they were from the same city, Philip and Andrew, from Bethsaida. And besides one of the cities along with Chorazin, which Matthew records in chapter 11 was the most where most of Jesus' miracles were done, that Jesus called them out for their unbelief and for their lack of repentance. And there was a lot of that in Jesus' time. I mean, Jesus, the Lord had shown them much before then and even now, but at that time, he had done so much that they believed him little. But one thing I see through this is that the disciples were always bringing people to Jesus. For example, Andrew brought Peter to Jesus saying, we have found the Messiah. 
And Philip had brought Nathanael to Jesus by telling him, we have found the one whom Moses and the prophets wrote of. So it was not out of place for someone, including the Greeks, when they reached out to the disciples to arrange a meeting. But what I'd like for you to see from this is that when Jesus had heard that the Greeks came looking for him, that was the signal that his public ministry had ended and the cross was just ahead. But it's what Jesus says next. The hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. See, that let us know that when the Greeks, the Gentiles had come to him, that the message had now been made clear and known throughout all of Galilee. And the surrounding regions that Jesus would now go to the cross and that he not come only to die just for Israel, but for the Gentiles also. And possibly the Greeks were listening. I don't know. The text doesn't reflect that, but we know the disciples were for sure when he said that the hour had come because he was referring, Un unless I die, no one will see me. In fact, now we even see him spiritually. The hour, what hour are we talking about? The hour of his death. <clears throat> this is the hour that the father had chosen in eternity past. In his perfect timing, it will be now. Ever since creation, God had revealed himself to man. With many revelations in the Old Testament, wanting to have fellowship and relationship with his creation to show his love for us and to receive the recognition and the glory and honor that he rightly deserves. In the garden of Eden, he would come in the cool of the day. And it wasn't long before Adam and Eve turned to sin to satisfy their desires. Cain, Cain, whom he tried to counsel, but he would not listen. Abraham, like we were telling the kids, we made a covenant with he made a covenant with and told him that if he could count the stars, so would the number of descendants be. He sent Moses to rescue a people he had chosen for himself and showed them many wonders and miracles. He met with them at Mount Sinai in thick clouds and smoke, the mountain trembling. And we would say to ourselves, surely if we would have been there, we would have believed, but we wouldn't have. We would have been the same way like them he sent prophets to call them back unto himself and to lead them in the right way and they killed them and stoned them to death he sent kings to them and many were wicked and did evil in their sight and led the people to follow in the same way they were going time and time again only to turn from the one true living god and to serve the gods of wood and stone and to serve the creature instead of the creator and why is it that we've always been this way you might be thinking jesus plainly told us for all who would listen and it's written to see in matthew 15 18 through 20 brother could you put that on the screen matthew 15 18 through 20 excuse me god bless you Amen. Okay, so it says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. Okay, and then in the next verse, he goes on to give us a list. He said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. And isn't it interesting that the first thing that he mentioned was evil thoughts? Because that's where it all starts. It begins with evil thinking. <clears throat> I mean, what are your thoughts? I know mine aren't good sometimes. <clears throat> and look, after that comes all the rest. After evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, lying and slanders. That's what's inside every man. And it comes from within. 
That's our inherent nature. Do you think it's any different today than it was in the time of Jesus? Man, people in the Old Testament were sacrificing their children to the fire god Molech. Their own children. We are all evil inside. There are none good. No, not one. We could not and would not ever follow God on our own because of the wicked and evil thoughts and intents of our hearts. That's why Jesus had to come. When? Galatians 4 tells us, but when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who are under the law. That's all of us, by the way that we might receive the adoptions as sons. Jesus was saying that the fullness of time had come and now the hour had arrived. The hour predetermined in eternity past. Christ, of course, prophesying is of his own life that much must be given up in death as a ransom for many. The gospel message. And within no less than four days' time, the Lord would be crucified for the sins of the world. For in the very next verse, back in John 12, in verse 24, speaking of his own death, burial, and resurrection, which none of us, by the way, would have ever been saved, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat the King James Version says a corn of wheat. And because a, a grain of wheat looks like a little baby here, a corn. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So right here, Jesus is describing us through his own example, the problem and the solution. He told us in Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And he goes on to describe the cost of following him, laying a foundation that may not be completed once it gets started because the cost was more than they anticipated. Count the cost. Even in our passage in verse 24, Jesus is speaking of his own life and that he had counted the cost. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame, and now is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne, having provided us with a living example of the gospel. May I ask you to whom he is speaking to today with his word? Surely, if it's to none other, it's the very least to everyone who would confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies and is buried, it will not bear fruit. It will remain fruitless. Do you want to know why we don't have more conversions and more converts today? The reason is because we just won't die to ourselves. Similar to what I shared with you with my earlier experience. I would have just died to myself. And you'll hear people say, well, that's just the way the world is today. And that's the time that we live in. Yet we sit in our fine panel houses and moan and groan and grumble and complain. There's just nothing that we can do. People will just not repent and believe. We just need to hold on until Jesus comes. No, the reason we're not seeing people saved is because we just won't die to ourselves. Our mission is to die to ourselves every single day and live for Christ. 
Jesus said to him, said to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Would you look up here for a moment, please? Have you died to yourself this morning? Have you picked up your cross this morning when you went out? Have you died today to live for him this morning? And why don't we die to ourselves? Because we love our lives too much. Look at the next verse. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. Daniel T reads, all those who want to be to my disciples must come and follow me because my servants must be where I am. We love our lives so much and we're so wrapped up in ourselves that we just want to be entertained today to follow after our own lusts and to have our ears tickled. Today, we are exposed to so many distractions that we don't want to die. We want to live for today, for tomorrow we die. And if you ask people, they'll say they are all right with God and they're all going to heaven. That's why we have fruitless churches and dead ministries and watered down sugar-coated messages. That's why people are lost and broken, are perishing. The word says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. When people go out, do we go out in the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are we going out in the power of Bob, for example? I mean, God will bless his word going forth, and it will never come back void. But how much more effective could we be if we just died to ourselves? You know, we seem to miss the whole reason we were created, the reason for which we exist. And the reason that we are here is that we would point others to Christ and let them know there is a God in heaven. There is a God in Israel. That we would be a beacon of bright light, drawing people to the goodness and kindness and greatness of our Lord and our Savior. And I am so thankful that we've blessed with a, I've been blessed with a pastor, Pastor Tootie. And God gets all the glory who leads by example and has motivated us and others to live as Christ and to let them know that and, and to which now the Holy Spirit is at work in us who goes before us, and if we'll follow him, he'll lead us and guide us. God is able. God is able to do abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. But can you imagine how much more God would do with us and use us if we would just die to ourselves? If we would just go forth and preach the gospel, every chance, every opportunity, turning every disappointment into his appointment. And how many lives have we seen change when we just get ourselves out of the way? Think about this, your little corn of wheat in your hand, and you love your little corn of wheat, and you protect it, and you keep it safe, and you keep it dry, and you nurture it, and you dress it up real nice, and you can give it a name, weedy, or whatever. and Notice, as long as you hold it tightly in your hand, nothing changes. Our little grain of wheat, the one given to us by God, our small little life will accomplish nothing. Even until the day that we die, if we never let it go, it will never be used by God and to give him the glory that he deserves. If we hold on to our little kernel of wheat because we love it so much, we are going to lose it. He who loves his life will lose it. The life, this life and what we do with it will determine whether God will get the glory from it and whether it will be a life of meaning and opportunity to others 
or it will be wasted and squandered on ourselves. What people fail to see today is that they are losing their lives and they don't even realize it. Because we are sold out for what we can do for ourselves, for our looks, for our sporting activities, for our businesses, and whatever else makes us happy, we are like going 90 miles an hour, and we have so little time left for God. And we say we want to be used by God, but we spend so much time and energy on ourselves. We miss the opportunities that he has for us, just like what happened to me. Can you imagine when we stand before him and he shows us all the times we could have made a difference when he called on us, but we just never answered the phone? And when we attend a church service, we don't want to hear strong gospel preaching. We'd rather hear a feel-good message and be entertained. I mean, isn't that the way it is anymore? Man, like if your service is too long, people are like, well, I won't be able to make it. I got things I got to do. And didn't the Bible warn us about this time? For the time will come where people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear, and they will turn away from the truth. They're going to go out. And this has created a spirit of compromise. Since churches don't seem to be growing and people are tapping out, we need to change things up a bit, don't we? We need to increase our attendance. I mean, we could have a better music program, some mega lighting, or maybe put, I don't know, some more comfortable seating. Uh, we could cut down on the sermon time and a highly offensive gospel message, or maybe give the church a new facelift. And before long, we'll look like many of the other churches today, lifeless, fruitless, and where once we wanted the entire world to know about Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he's now just an add-on to the program. And before long, there's no evidence of life and no evidence that we are born again. And no wonder we doubt. But if we would just learn to die, that there is life after death. And in doing so, it would bring forth much fruit. And it's always been that way. Death to the giver, I mean, death to the, death to the giver and life to the receiver. Death gives way to life. And we must keep plowing, keep pressing on. For if we do not give up in due season, we will reap a harvest, Galatians 6, 9. For we know not what type of soil the seed will fall upon. It could be rocky soil, it could be fertile soil. But that doesn't matter. I'll tell you one thing, if the seed isn't sown, nothing's ever going to become of it. And how does that seed to make it into the ground? From our hand where we're holding on to our seedling, our life, we have to let go. And when we let go of what we want, what we want, we have to let go of our desires. Because you know why? Because it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about what he wants. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, we have to let go of our precious little grain. And once it's dead and it's buried in the ground, now, now God can use it. He makes the ground fertile, and he's the one who waters it. He's the one who grows it. He's the one who gives it the light that it needs. He matures it, producing a crop of 30, 60, and 100-fold or more. Some of you might be thinking right now, not that I'm a mind reader, but I'm not gifted like that. It's awkward for me, or I'm not that qualified. And I can share how the Lord squashed that with what the apostle made known to us in 2 Corinthians 12. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. 
For whenever I am weak, then I'm strong. The Holy Spirit will take what you know and what you say and speak directly to another person's soul, telling them exactly what that one needs to hear. It doesn't matter whether you're talking to kings or emperors or presidents or professors or children. Listen, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of you who are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you, instead, God deliberately chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think that they are wise. And he chose those who are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose the things despised of the, by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important so that no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ Jesus. For your benefit, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. He is the one who made us acceptable to God. He made us pure and holy, and he gave himself to purchase our freedom. As the scriptures say, the person who wishes to boast, it boasts only what the Lord has done. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. God works through us to do what pleases him. Jesus said, go into all the world. And preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. That was speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Verse 25 says, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. Do you love this world? Do you love the things of this world? The material things of this world? Those who hold on to these kind of things lose their life in this world. They have everything that they want here right now. And they hate to lose their life and other belongings here. Their treasure is only intangible things that they can see and touch and feel. And they will try everything and anything to prolong their life. And the rub is, if you ask them, and so many of them will tell you that they are Christian. And if you ask them if you are ready, if they are ready to go to heaven, they'll tell you, of course they are, most definitely. Just not right now. They love their life here. If Jesus would only hold off just a little bit longer, I mean, things really aren't that bad yet. Paul said this in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For the man who had a glimpse of the third heaven and still yet he would desire to live in this world for only one reason, to point others to Christ, that they would know of his love and for the sake of his glorious gospel, staying yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. And that's just it. Whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? If we try to save our life, we're going to lose it anyway. Be real. I don't care how advanced medicine becomes, we're all going to die. The scriptures say the wages of sin is death. And we are all sinners. <clears throat> you may think that you're a good person. You haven't really done anything bad, but you're only good in your eyes. But in the eyes of a perfect and holy God, we are wretched and filthy sinners. 
And there's places where you can freeze your body until a current cure comes along. But still, even if they found a cure and thawed you out, you're still going to die of something else. The only way to live forever is by giving your life to Jesus and receiving eternal life. To die to yourself and to live for him. <clears throat> in order to make that happen, Jesus had to come into the world and purchase us from the slave market of sin and death. By living a sinless life, one we could never live. Because everything we touch with our hands as sinners, it may make filthy. He gave up his life to save ours. He became sin, our sin on the cross. And that's where the exchange took place. He became me. He became you. <clears throat> and he paid the debt we owe to an eternal God. The father crushed his own son, pouring out his wrath upon him. The wrath that we deserve. God bless you, Miss Minnie. So that we could live and have eternal life with him. If it were not for what Jesus did for us, we would be left with the debt. We would still owe it. Paying that eternal debt ourselves in a torment for all eternity. Instead of accepting what Jesus did, Accepting what, that Jesus was tormented for us, we, by denying him, elect to pay that for ourselves. The place of torment that Jesus told us about when he was here is not away from God. It's away from the love of God. He created hell for all those who didn't want to be with him and wanted nothing to do with him. And there they go. And because of that, he now says to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. And we have that invitation to follow him, to come after him, to follow him, to be where he is. For if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, even on the third day, we shall be saved. Not because of anything we did. It's all because of what he did. And it's done for us. Verse 26 says, therefore, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant shall be also. If we are going to follow Christ, it doesn't mean to walk behind him or just tag along. It means to be like him. <clears throat> Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So moment by moment, day by day, becoming more like Christ. Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's why he had said, speaking to his disciples in the multitude, he told them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If anyone serves me, Jesus said, the father will honor him. Therefore, we can say, also as it says in Psalm 91, 14 through 16, because he has loved me, therefore I, deliver, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. And honor him and let him behold my salvation. And in Luke 12, 37, Jesus had said, Blessed are those slaves who the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. In verse 27, Jesus says, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. What hour again? The hour of his death. Verse 
But if you remember, he said in his prayer to his father, when asking him if it would be possible to let this cup pass from me, he followed that up with, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Most of us live like, let my will be done. The Lord's soul was in trouble because of the pain he would endure or the scourging or the lashings or the crown of thorns smashed on his head or the nails through his hands and feet. His soul was troubled because he knew what it would be like to face the wrath of almighty God. The separation from his father. And everyone here will stand before God to give an account. For it's appointed once for men to die and then the judgment. But I want to comfort all those who are here in Christ. That Jesus came to this hour. The hour had not come to him. He came to that hour. He came for all those who are lost and without hope to rescue us. And in John 14, he says and tells us, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. For who? For you. Everyone hearing my voice right now. That promise we talked about with the kids. For all those who belong to him or will belong to him. And if I go to a place, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That there where I am, you may be also. What a precious promise we've been given. God's faithful. He keeps his promises. This hour that Jesus speaks of is the culmination of the entire reason, reason for Jesus' earthly ministry. That God would come and pay the price for us to save us, not from us, from himself. And so we find ourselves here. The gospel is all about death to self. We must die that others will live. We must die to ourselves so that we may live for God. To give up something for the one who gave it all for us. Give up your time. Give up your money. Give up yourself. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. God will take whatever you give him and multiply it. Let me end with this. You know, today, it seems like there's so many scams everywhere you turn. Like someone is always trying to get you to do something to benefit them at your loss and at your cost. Well, let me offer you this right now, a breath of fresh air, courtesy of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord only wants the best and has already provided the best for you. And all he wants is your love and your loyalty and your faithfulness in return. That's it. He paid everything. The Lord paid everything to keep us from having to perish from all eternity in a place so terrifying that the scriptures warn us over and over again, avoid it at all costs. And there's so many tragic examples of those who have gone that way in the Bible. One tragic account of a man who only lived for himself. Then crying out to please someone, someone to his family to let them know of the reality of the torment that he was experiencing so they could avoid it for themselves. There are not many paths to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Knowing what I just told you and with the fear that comes for 
all those who would reject that offer, I stand, if it were at the door, holding it wide open, and bid you to come, come in. This is the way. Walk in it. This is the way to salvation. This is the way to life. This is the way through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the door. He is the way to eternal life. I want to end with this prayer. And then I've got something I want to share with you afterwards. If you'll bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I pray that today is the day for those who do not know you that they would follow you and Lord Jesus all the days of our lives, bringing you the glory and honor that you so rightfully deserve. Father, I pray that this message, the one that you gave me to bring, will find fertile soil in the hearts of all those who heard it. And it's in the name above all and any other name, the name of Jesus Christ that we ask and pray. Amen. When I was uh, when I was at Home Depot, uh, I was just telling you earlier, I had to go to customer service and there was a lady there that was helping me and she had like a tattoo on her arm. It said, uh, it said, uh, live my life out in, uh, live my life in the sun. And I said to her, I said, if you're really meaning that, like it's pretty hot out there. It's like 113 degrees. And she said, uh, she came back with this. She said, I want to have that changed to S O N instead of S U N. And then she shared with me that, uh, that she, um, <clears throat> At the church she goes to, she uh, wor works with the children in the ministry with the children uh, in grades like three through five. She had two children that were in like six. One was in six and one was in eight, uh, grade eight. And that um, she didn't want them in her class because that would just distract. That's why she took the younger grades because that would distract her from being with the children, you know, so anyway, uh, she wrote a poem and uh, she shared that with me. I want to read that. Um, and uh, it spoke to me that like you never know who you're going to run into. And these people who die themselves, but to live for Christ in other ways, just any way that you can, God can take that and use it. You don't have to be anyone special. All you have to do is have a servant's heart and God can use you. And you don't have to be worried about what you say because it's people hear it different. People, the Holy Spirit uses it to speak to people what they need to hear. Anyway, uh, the poem's untitled, but it, uh, it says, uh, you picked me up and dusted me off. You say you are mine, a child of God. The world makes me feel lost and broken. But you whisper to me, child, you are chosen. Fear and rejection try to sweep me off my feet. But I am reminded by your spirit that you are a friend to me. Seeds of my past try to enter my mind and take root. But Second Corinthians say that I am brand new. The mirror tells me lies that I know are not true. Because I know I am wonderfully and beautifully made by you. The world tries to remind me of all the things that I am not. The enemy feeds me lies and tries to take hold of my thoughts. But I have a father in heaven who calls me by name. And through the power of the cross, he has broken every chain. Every chain that once tied me to desperation and sorrow. But now through the glory of God, 
I look forward to tomorrow. The chaos of this world continues to surround. The enemy plots and lurks about. Psalm 16 teaches me to keep my eyes on the Lord. And Matthew 28 tells me you are with me during the storm. So I stay in prayer and read your living word. Memorizing your promises verse by verse. You hold me, Lord, in the palm of your hand. I will continue to trust you even when I don't understand. And when the evil of this world is all that I see, I will continue to remind myself greater is he who lives in me. Amen. That's beautiful. Another servant of Christ. Man.